not a lawyer. I assume there are going to be lawyers in this group. Uh, I have, however, as part of my teaching and writing, talk about and write about law, mostly constitutional law, international law. And I write from a critical perspective. A lot of people who are experts in international law are somewhat committed to defend it to the teeth. <laughs> but I, I look at everything critically, so also international law. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, so you'll see where, where I'm coming from. First of all, I'm going to talk about international law in general, what it is, how it's created, how it's enforced. And then I'm going to give some examples in terms of human rights treaties. And then I'm going to talk about trade law, and then war. And I will then talk about some general problems with the system of international law and with globalization itself. I, last year when I was here, I did give a talk on globalization with a lot of critique of globalization. But this is just one more part of globalization, the spread of international law. And again, if you need clarification, I don't mind being interrupted, but let's not have discussion until the end. Um, well, my topic is, does international law exist? How is that possible? International law is indeed flourishing throughout the world. It deals with everything under the sun, even the space above it. Among some of its recent concerns are polar bears, bananas, indigenous people's communal rights, nuclear weapons, and the type of sugar in Mexican soft drinks. There's still, of course, plenty of work with the older agenda of international law, which dealt with treatment of diplomats, the mitigation of warfare, and piracy. All of that is still happening, but there are so many of these new topics everything under the sun is now dealt with somewhere or other by international law. And big changes have occurred since the Second World War. Because before the Second World War, international law did not ban genocide. It did not ban apartheid. It did not concern itself with other kinds of human rights violations and it didn't concern itself with pollution. How a nation treated its own residents was not a concern of international law before the Second World War. The other de new development since that time is that international law was created on the assumption that it would be between nations only between nations. Nations were the only subjects of international law. Today that's changed because today individuals can partake of cases in international law, corporations, non-governmental organizations, indigenous communities, and even regional groupings such as the European Union. And that's all quite new for international law too to regard any of those, recognize any of those as subjects of international law. These changes began with the Nuremberg Charter of 1945, with the creation of the United Nations in 1945, and with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. The Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was actually inspired by both the United States Colonies uh, Declaration of Independence and President Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedom Speech. Roosevelt proposed four freedoms that people everywhere in the world ought to enjoy. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. This was a recognition 
of the socialist critique of capitalism, which in 1945 was something of a threat to capitalism. Uh, many people did not think that capitalism would survive the Second World War. But uh, to many of the people who signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was a, a symbol that you did not need revolution for progress towards well-being for all. Because the Declaration of Human Rights included not only what are called the liberal rights of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, but also things like the right to an adequate standard of living, to health care, to education, the right to work, the right of workers to form unions. All of that is in the Declaration of Human Rights. And it was, in part, an attempt to refute the challenge that socialism was providing and seemed to provide in 1945. <coughs> so, international human rights was one of the major purposes of the UN. Other purposes of the United Nations were outlawing war, ending colonialism in a fruitful way, and I mean that in a punny sense too. Uh, colonialism had to end, but not in a way that would deprive the colonial powers of the economic resources that they had enjoyed. Um, and also bringing all nations into a global economy. That was one of the purposes of the UN. The whole idea that there should be a global economy based on free trade, in fact. And um, also facilitating cooperation in every kind of activity. And it's, it's been very successful in that last way because things like uh, weather and radio communications and all sorts of facilitation of all sorts of connections throughout the world have been promoted very successfully by the UN. Food standards are some people challenge some of the food standards, but even something like that, standardization of food and weights and measures. Um, again, international law assumes a world of sovereign nations, but this is also changing because many non-state actors are increasingly important in the world and there's a lot of challenge to the whole idea of nations and nationalism. But uh, international law has to recognize this and is following the law. How is international law created? How can there be international law when there's no international government? Well, international law is created the same way law and government were created originally, through power and self-interest. Political power is the ability to make people or institutions or groups do things they wouldn't otherwise do because of opposition, because of lack of information, or because of passivity. And political power is based on the ability to deliver reward and punishment. Many, many kinds of resources enable this, from, of course, wealth and military strength, but also technology and eloquence. eloquence. If you can persuade people of something, you don't even have to have any resources behind it. You may be able to exert political power to change people's minds, the same way preachers in the old days said, uh, if you don't stop sinning, you'll go to hell. Well, the preachers didn't have to produce hell. Hell didn't even have to exist. But if people are persuaded to change their way of behaving, then the preacher has political power. In the same way with every kind of persuasion for self-esteem. And a lot of the UN treaties actually are based on that. No country wants to be known as a place that tolerates slavery or 
child marriage or terrible pollution. They are concerned about self-esteem and that's one reason why they obey provisions in so many of these treaties. So it isn't simply wealth or military strength that creates political power. So, of course, law, whether it's national or international, may create far greater benefits for the rich and powerful. But in fact, the little guy gets something out of the deal. And we see this in international law as well as national law. Because it's better to have laws than a system of anarchy where raw power would be the only thing that counted. And also, as in national law, there are nations that are powerful enough to violate the law and get away with it. Just as in a nation there are people and corporations that can violate the law and get away with it. <laughs> so, it doesn't mean that international law doesn't exist. So, just as contracts create binding law among private parties, international law comes into being by consent among nations. And often this is in the form of treaties. Treaties are sometimes called charters or con covenants or conventions or agreements. They can be bilateral between two countries or multilateral among several countries or some of the multilateral ones are among almost all the countries in the world. A, a declaration is not a binding treaty though. Declaration is intention of perhaps forming a treaty but it has no legal binding effect. International law also defines how entities are recognized as nations, which, by the way, in this system, in the system of international law, nations are called states. And I don't use that term because it's confusing. <laughs> so I can't talk about countries or nations. But if you look at a, a, the treaties, you'll see it says states party to this treaty, meaning nations. So, the, the recognition of a new state or a new government has to be done by other nations. The UN itself cannot confer recognition. To become a, a member of the UN, a nation has to be approved by nine out of the 15 members of the Security Council. And there are five permanent members that have a veto. And so any of those can end the process, and then approved by two-thirds of the General Assembly. Palestine has been recognized as a state by 136 countries, but it has only non-state observer status at the UN. It doesn't have full membership, because it hasn't been able to pass a veto in the Security Council. You have to have only nine votes, but you have to have <coughs> votes of all the five permanent members. But it could happen in the future. And treaties sometimes take years and years to draft and to get nations to sign on and to be ratified. The ratification process differs in every country. Last July, there was a committee at the UN which started to create a treaty to govern marine biodiversity in the high seas. And this is a very tricky idea because some nations view the high seas, that means beyond all territorial waters, as belonging to no country and therefore you can do anything there that is not otherwise prohibited. Other countries regard the high seas as belonging to everyone, so the resources should be protected and shared. But right now what predominates are the resources of the 
high seas go to those nations that have the technology to exploit them. Treaties make, create international institutions. Their regulations and resolutions may become legally enforceable rules. For example, the UN Security Council may put economic sanctions on a country that it thinks is disturbing the peace. Or the World Trade Organization's rules become legally enforceable. And many regulations of the UN uh, agencies, various agencies of the UN concerned with civil aviation or telecommunications, food safety, environmental protection, and those rules become part of international law. And why do the nations follow rules? Because they see it in their self-interest and they're concerned about their reputations. They have to defend their internal policies, too. Not only their policies toward other nations, but they have to defend the way they treat their own citizens at the UN. It's now a international matter. Um, the European Court of Justice, which enforces the European Union Treaty, ruled last September that member states cannot ban genetically modified crops without scientific reason. This has been a controversy for years and years. But also years, some years ago, arbitrators re ruled that the European Union should import US non-hormone treated beef. So the European Union said they won't take US beef because it's treated with hormones. Arbitrators ruled they, they have to take U.S. beef, but they don't have to take any that's treated with hormones. So, the, so there's a give and take, there's some progress in some things. Um, not all of the resolutions of U.N. committees, though, are legally enforceable. There was one in December 2015 where the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention issued an opinion that Mr. Julian Assange was arbitrarily denied by the governments of Sweden and the United Kingdom of his freedom. Arbitrarily detained, I'm sorry. And it recognized that Mr. Assange was entitled to his freedom of movement and to compensation. This was a, a committee of the UN but it has not been enforced so far. It hasn't become legally enforceable. May someday. There's another way that inter... Yes? Even though he wasn't actually detained, because he has been in the embassy of Ecuador. I'm sorry, you have to speak louder. Sorry. This decision, even though Mr. Assange wasn't actually detained, because he, was, he has been staying in the Ecuadorian embassy yes. in London. Yes. So even though he wasn't actually detained, the ruling... Yes, well, they, they consider him arbitrarily detained because if he came out, he would okay. get into trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's stuck, yes. <coughs> you said it may, it's not enforceable now, but it may become enforceable. Yes. What would it take for it to become enforceable? Okay. Um, now we go on to how, how international, in a minute I'm going to talk about how it's enforced. Okay, the other, I just want to say there's another way that international law is created. It's called customary international law. And it's based on the usual practice of nations. And a country isn't bound if it has consistently objected to the practice. For example, customary law regarding the treatment of diplomats or fishing vessels that are distressed fishing vessels uh, often become codified in treaties later on. But for years or maybe even centuries, these practices are regarded as customary international law because almost every nation observes it. And that is, that is a very important 
factor because there are things that nations don't observe <laughs> that then become, do not become part of international, and I'll, I'll come to some of those. Um, and then there are some rules that are considered so fundamental that all nations are bound. For example, uh, prohibitions on the use of force against states, racial discrimination, state-sponsored torture, genocide, and slavery. These are considered use cogens or compelling law. Most of international law is enforced by voluntary cooperation. A treaty will have within in it its methods of enforcement. For example, it might say any complaints about breaches of the treaty are to be resolved by arbitration. Human rights conventions may require that each country make a report every three years, which will be reviewed by experts and delegates. When a country ratifies a treaty, it agrees, agrees to the method of enforcement. And also, countries may and do make reservations as they, as they um, ratify the treaty. And that, and that, so they're not bound by specific provisions. Now most disputes are settled by negotiation, mediation, arbitration, or conciliation. The Iran hostage crisis of 1979 to 1981 was resolved with Algeria as a mediator. There is a permanent court of arbitration that was created at The Hague in 1899, and it is still in operation. And these methods are much cheaper and easier and faster than disputes resolved by a court. And so most of the disputes are resolved in these ways. But if these methods fail, then international courts may come into the picture. And one of the, the flagship, of course, is the International Court of Justice at The Hague. That deals only with disputes among nations. It doesn't deal with corporations or individuals or communities. Um, and the, and there's all, there are also regional courts. There's an American Court of Human Rights, dealing with the organization of American states and the declaration of rights, of human rights of the organization of American states. Are, are you a lawyer, by the way? Yeah, okay. I, I suspect there'd be some in here. That's all right. Um, and, but the majority of cases applying international law are actually settled, if they're settled in a court, they're settled in the national courts of countries. And most of the, many of these treaties have provisions that a case has to be dealt with in the national courts first before it can go to any international court. And then if it's unsatisfactory, it go to a an international court if, if the court has jurisdiction, and that's often very difficult. Here's an example of, of a case settled in a national court. In 1988, the U.S. District Court in New York refused to enforce the U.S. government's request to close the Palestine Liberation Organization mission to the United Nations. They said it was a violation of the treaty between the United States and the UN, the headquarters agreement. No, I'm sorry again, I didn't catch what, what did they, they refused to do? They, the US government asked, um, tried to close the Palestine Liberation Organization mission to the UN. Admission to the UN. Yeah, it was the mission. Yeah, they said, uh, this is, not a legal thing. No. The 
The case went to the U.S. District Court in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. And they said, they, in other words, were adjudicating the international law on this particular treaty. And they said, nope, that mission has a right to remain open according to this treaty. You can't just push them around. And so many cases in international law deal with either diplomats or family law or commerce. And all, most of those cases are settled in the courts of all the different nations of the world. So all judges have to apply international law. The human rights treaties, however, tend to be enforced by cooperative and collaborative methods. When there's a violation, the persons complaining are expected to go through the national courts first, and often the uh, publicity and admonition are the punishments for countries violating them. War crimes prosecutions, as defined by the International Criminal Court, are also supposed to be initiated in domestic courts. And some of them have been. Some countries, however, that includes Britain and Belgium and Spain, have a doctrine called universal jurisdiction, which, where they claim that the courts of their own country can prosecute individuals who have are alleged to have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide, regardless of where these crimes were committed and the nationality of the perpetrators or the victims. So it's called universal jurisdiction, and there have been convictions on this basis. Um, now, another way that treaties are enforced is by the incorporation of provisions into domestic law, into legislation or court decisions. Now, there are government agencies and non-governmental organizations in every country which have an interest in the subjects of many of these treaties, like they're interested in promoting children's rights or ending pollution or racial justice or whatever, and all those organizations are very helpful in enforcing international law. They, they use this as one more thing that they can influence people with, saying this is contrary to international law. And also, many local governments have incorporated into their mission statements provisions of the human rights treaties. Like uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts has the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, actually the whole thing is part of their uh, mission statement. In the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been incorporated in many cities or towns mission statements, so they, they're aware of it. Um, there's also a, a Convention Against Tobacco and uh, many certain municipalities have also included that. They say, we have to work to end the scourge of tobacco. Um, Non-governmental organizations like the International Red Cross and Amnesty International have important roles in creating um, and, and creating, monitoring, and enforcing human rights treaties. And merely recognizing a problem can be the first step in, in obtaining justice. Now I think I have to sit down for a while. <laughs> so, if you could just move that up. Okay. Now, okay. uh, now I'm going to give some examples of. Harry, did you make sure that's on, Harry? It doesn't matter. It doesn't head out. Yeah. But we can hear it. Okay. Now I'm going to give some examples. Um, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was drafted in 1948, there is no mention of indigenous people. There's no there was no recognition at the UN 
of their existence in 1948. It just wasn't an issue. It was a different time. Um, there also was no mention of same-sex unions. There were a lot of things that were of the time. In fact, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stresses that the family is the basic institution of society, which today looks a little conservative. But that was, that was the way it was, and of course it had to be drafted to fit the values of a whole, whole variety of nations. Um, however, in 1992, when there was the first UN conference on the environment in Brazil, there was at the same time a parallel conference that was the very first time in the world that there was a world convention of indigenous people from all over, from, from New Guinea, from Canada, from Lapland. And after that, indigenous people did have a voice at the UN. And there was, in 2007, a declaration of the rights of indigenous people. There hasn't been a treaty that has been formed and adopted yet, but there has been a working group on this constantly, and there are indigenous people are now involved with the work of many UN agencies. There's definitely a recognition of it. The um, Organization of American States, as I've mentioned, has a commission on human rights. And a recent one of their investigations was of the human rights of indigenous women. But there is also an inter-American court of human rights. And in, in 2016, it heard a case called Kalinya y Locono versus Suriname, in which it recognized two villages' rights to juridical personality. These were two villages, uh, Kalinya and Locono. The right of collective ownership of their territory and their right to environmental protection. This, this was something new, that collective ownership was recognized over traditional territory. There was no legal title involved. Recognition of, of communal rights is starting to happen. And now, of course, in other parts of the world, indigenous communities are petitioning for such recognition. And it may happen because one court influences another. There isn't any principle of stare decisis in international law. In other words, there are no precedents are not binding on future decisions but there's always influence from one court to another. Um, by the way, among, among the, an interesting aspect of the human rights treaties, although they were divided into, the declaration was divided into two parts. One was for civil and political rights, and the other was for economic, social, and cultural rights. And so there are two separate treaties following the Declaration. The reason for that, the major reason, is because it was expected that the United States would not sign the one for economic, social, and cultural rights, which was absolutely true. It has never signed that one. So the civil and political rights are the right to a fair trial, uh, due process, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Economic, social, and cultural rights includes the rights to a decent standard of living, the rights to workers to unionize, that, those, and cultural, the right for cultural participation. Then there is a European Convention on Human Rights. That's a legal treaty amongst Oh, I think it's about 46 European countries. It includes, it's very vast. It goes way beyond the European Union. It's a separate 
organization called the European Council. And, um, and it's mostly about human rights. It includes Russia. It includes Eastern European countries. It includes Turkey, as well as Western Europe. That court recently upheld Belgium's ban on full face veils. They did not want women walking around with full face veils, or for that matter, anyone walking around looking like a woman <laughs> with a full face veil. Um, it also, in, the court also upheld France's ban on on the grounds that it prevented people from, in France from living together. The court said when a woman covers her entire face, uh, except for her eyes, she is breaching the right of others to live in a space of socialization which makes living together easier. So the court allows, although freedom of religion is of course part of these declarations, uh, the court has permitted these laws. On the other hand, the same court upheld the requirement in some Muslim countries for women to be veiled. So the human rights treaties are in force with some recognition of cultural differences. Uh, another exception in the international human rights treaties is this. They all, of course, talk about freedom of speech. But in many, many nations of the world, hate speech is banned. And that includes Canada, and France, the Netherlands, Germany, South Africa. And this is not considered a violation of these treaties. These countries are permitted to ban hate speech because they feel that this is more important and that especially uh, speech condemning religions, anti-Semitic speech, uh, even Holocaust denial. People have been, uh, people have been jailed in France and Canada for Holocaust denial and that's not considered a violation of the treaties because it's considered uh, a, a cultural thing of those countries. In South Africa, actually, the Constitution prohibits not only hate speech, but also advocacy of war. And some constitutions have in their provisions environmental, the right to a clean environment. So a lot of the human rights treaties and environmental treaties have been enforced by incorporation into constitutions and law. And this has not been so difficult because most of the constitutions of the world have been written since 1945. For, because, of course, most countries in the world did not exist before 1945. But in addition to that, the older countries, the countries that existed all along, Germany, France, Finland, they have new constitutions that have been, come in since 1945. And so they've incorporated a lot of the provisions that you see in the treaties. Um, uh, There's another recent case, not the most important kind of case, the most important human rights cases and cases involving children's rights have to do with slavery, with trafficking in children and women, with uh, terrible uh, forced labor conditions. But some of these other cases are interesting in showing the scope of the treaties. In Italy, six same-sex couples protested because they had gotten married outside of Italy where same-sex marriage is not legal. And they were unable to have their marriages recognized by Italy. The European Court of Human, Months, La Human Rights last month held 
that there had been a violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. One of the couples began to try to register their marriage in 2002. After the local government wouldn't allow that, which is where you usually register the marriages, they went to the Italian courts. The highest court in Italy refused their claim in 2012. Remember, they started to do this 2002. They joined then with other couples and applied to the European Court of Human Rights. And the final decision came last month. <laughs> the court required Italy to pay 5,000 euros to each of the applicants and 19,000 euros for costs. In the meantime, Italy in 2016 had been influenced by this long drawn out litigation. It enabled registration of these marriages within the same law that provided for same-sex unions. So you see, access to international courts, just like the Supreme Court of the United States, requires an enormous amount of patience and funds. <laughs> and often these are supplied by hum non-governmental human rights organizations, often with grants from foundations. Yeah. Just one question. Are these marriages now accepted, you said, as unions? So are they accepted the same as heterosexual couples? Well, um, in, in Italy, they don't recognize same-sex marriages. But if you get married in another country, you're supposed to be, have that marriage recognized in the country you live in. So they made a kind of compromise there. They said, okay, we're not going to allow or same-sex marriages in Italy. You don't, you can't, there isn't a law saying same-sex couples could get married in Italy. But if you got married outside of Italy, you want to register this marriage. We have a law for unions and you can, we'll include a section for people who have gotten married outside of Italy there so that you are, you get legal recognition for your relationship. <laughs> it's, it's, that's the way compromises often occur, yeah. Um, uh, here's a, another uh, court. There are so many. I mean, when, if you take the course, I'll go into much more detail about the different courts and treaties. But the European Court of Justice is not a human rights court. It's a court created to enforce the rules of the European Union, which is a largely an economic union, somewhat political union too. But a lot of the rules of the European Union concern labor disputes. So here was a case that went, came to the European Court of Justice. A Danish child care worker was dismissed because of obesity. He lost his job as a child care worker. And so any person in the European Union has labor rights, even in their own country, deriving from their membership in the European Union. Now the European Court of Justice heard this case and they sent it back to the Danish court that had heard it in the first place to find out if his obesity disabled him in caring for children. If, his dis if he was disabled in caring for children because of his obesity, then his job was protected by the European Union rules. If, however, it did not disable him, he can't make a claim that he was discriminated against as disabled. Yes, so there is a rule saying there should be no discrimination on the grounds of disability. He applied for that. You know, he said he, he was fired and he said, oh, I've been discriminated against the grounds of disability. The court says, wait a second. Maybe you're not disabled. Maybe, maybe 
there's some other reason why you were fired. If, however, you're really disabled, then we can protect you. It's very circular because it's catch-22 that if you're yeah, disabled, exactly. you probably cannot take care of the child. So yes, and, and then you make you know yeah, that's what yeah. you make undue court. Yeah, I mean, that, I, and I think this is a kind of case that's going to come up in many countries with labor protection issues, whether obesity is something that um, comes under disability rights. By the way, the, one of the most recent human rights conventions at the UN has been a convention for the rights of people with disabilities. It's a very new one. Yes? Would there not be another convention somewhere which says you cannot fight people for the wrong grounds of discrimination? And yes. And might be considered discriminatory. Yes. You cannot fire people this is the usual thing. If on the grounds of discrimination for age, for sex, for nationality, for religion, but you can fire them for other reasons. In the United States, that certainly is true. In the United States, you can be fired for any reason except a few of those. And one of the things that uh, that was going to be in the, in the uh, Human Rights Convention originally, but it didn't get through, was that you cannot fire anyone for political reasons, for political discrimination, but that didn't, that didn't get through. So you can fire somebody if you don't, if you don't like their politics, but not if you don't like their religion. <laughs> so uh, so that, this, is a, this is the way lawyers are. You know, you, you can't claim anything. Um, now, a lot of useful information, a lot of useful um, activity is, is going down through the world because of international law. But the other side of the picture is this. It has really been very, it has not been success, very successful in the most important matters which would include, first of all, the abolition of war. Secondly, even the mitigation of warfare, which has been an objective of international law since the Civil War in the United States. Global justice and the salvation of the environment has not done very well on these things. And I will give some examples. One of them is the World Trade Organization, which was created by treaty. Its purpose was to promote free trade throughout the world. And by free trade is meant countries that join have to eliminate all barriers to trade. They, this might include labor and environmental protections. It certainly includes tariffs, subsidies, quotas, and preferences. All of these are can be considered barriers to free trade. The other thing is most, most of the trade treaties require free investment so that anything for sale, such as forests, mines, hospitals, nuclear power plants, telephone services, newspapers, can be bought by any corporation on earth. Provided it's for sale. If the government is running the nuclear power plant, then it's not for sale. But if it's open to be purchased by local corporations, and you have a treaty, an investment treaty, free trade treaty, you may have to allow it to be purchased by any corporation in the world. And there's plenty of this. Of foreign corporations owning telephone services, forest mines. There was even a controversy in a Latin American country, when McDonald's wanted to provide the school lunches for an elementary school, public school, and uh, they said under the treaty they have to do that. Now the public school could provide its own lunches, no problem. The governmental lunches, nobody would bother them. But they had let out contracts for corporations to provide it. And McDonald said, well, why can't we? I forget how that was ended, but that's the kind of thing that happens. Now, many problems with economic 
globalization, which I spoke about last year and is probably on the website of the Center for Global Justice somewhere. It might be. Anyway, you could ask me for a copy of it. Um, but here's one problem. I, I, I've always enjoyed talking about this one. Uh, one rule of the World Trade Organization led to the Banana War. I, I'm just very fond of this Banana War. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because when I teach this, I play the music, the, the cheers, the, the team songs, the, what do you call the fight songs of the two sides of the Banana War. And one of them is Chiquita Banana on one side, and the other one is Deo on the other side. <laughs> and that really, if you, that's, that's the Banana War. So um, the European Union was giving a very small preference to the bananas produced in their former colonies of the Caribbean and also of Africa. And these bananas were grown on small family farms that were not heavily chemicalized, they weren't industrialized. Then they were a very important source of livelihood for the people and even for the overall economy in places like the Windward Islands, like Dominica, Santa Lucia, St. Vincent, Trinidad, Jamaica, those countries. The export of bananas is <coughs> an important part of the economy. But the, the European Union then had reserve quotas for these bananas. And no tariffs on those bananas. Still, at the time, the multinational corporations, Chiquita, Dole, had 60% of the European market of bananas. But in 1996, Chiquita and the other agribusiness companies said it was an unfair trade practice, according to the World Trade Organization, to give any preferences at all, even tiny preferences. This went on for years. <laughs> the case went on for years. Eventually, the World Trade Organization arbitrator said, the corporations are right, the, the preferences must be eliminated. And they were. It took many years, so it wasn't until, it started in 1996, it wasn't until maybe three, four years ago that they had to cut it off. So they had time to adjust, if there was a way of adjusting. But the small farmers were not able to compete in the free market. And along with a, a considerable decline in tourism to the, in the Caribbean, many of those countries had to try to scrape together an economy to replace the export of bananas. And it turned out that among the most promising things they could do to get foreign exchange was being tax havens or selling citizenship. And that's what they do. Some of these countries are actually selling citizenship. If they are part of the British Commonwealth, there's an advantage to some foreigners, foreign corporations, foreign business people, having a citizenship in one of these countries. So that's what they do. And then they're tax havens. And not, not for the banana reason at all, but Bermuda <laughs> is also a, now the major industry there is offshore, offshore corp corporate headquarters. Yeah, and it's a, it's a real shame because uh, Bermuda was a pretty nice place, you know, but tourism declined there and the world changed. Um, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Ag Agreement, permits no discrimination against foreign investors, no expropriation without compensation. And disputes must go to the, sorry about this bureaucratic language, I have to do a little bit of it, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes of the World Bank. And there, which is in Washington, D.C., the center maintains panels of arbitrators and conciliators, and they're generally lawyers, 
and they can be chosen by the parties to the dispute. And they settle disputes between corporations and governments, among other things. All disputes coming under NAFTA. Now, the, these arbitrators and these lawyers are, I would say most of them are corporate lawyers dealing in international law. And a few of them are professors at law schools who deal in international law. But even the professors at law schools who deal in international law are often corporate lawyers. They often are very much oriented toward business and have had careers in business before they come there. So, so there is a, a considerable bias in this particular uh, place in this particular center for corporate views. <laughs> um, corporations under NAFTA can sue governments, and that's something new. Canada has been sued most of all of the three nations, and it's lost most cases of all of them. The United States has never been successfully sued. Uh, the Ethel Corporation of the United States challenged a Canadian ban on a gasoline additive. MMT, don't ask what that is for. You can look it up, but it's a very long word. Um, and Canada lost. It repealed the ban. It settled out of court for $13 million. Another ban in Canada was Quebec had banned 2,4-D pesticide for use on lawns. It, it, it permitted it for other uses. But it said, if you're having a lawn or decoration, we don't want to have that pesticide. It's not necessary. But Dow Corporation sued Canada, and Canada lost, and had to rescind the ban. However, they didn't have to pay this time. All they had to do was issue a statement, a public statement, that the chemical was not harmful. Okay. And now in a Mexican case, uh, Archer Daniels Midland and Tate and Lyle challenged Mexico's tax on soft drinks that were sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. Mexico had no tax on soft drinks if cane sugar were used, but it only tax soft drinks sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. It may have said, well, this is a health issue. Well, the, the center said, no, this is not a health issue. This is a, a restraint on trade because you don't want the foreign corn syrup to come in. You want cane sugar to be used, you know, it's, so they lost. Mexico was ordered to pay three, 33 and a half million US dollars to Archer Daniel Midland and Tate and Lyle. And a similar case was won by Cargill, which ordered Mexico to pay 90 million US dollars. Now, I don't know whether Mexico actually paid all that or any of it. I'm not, it sometimes it takes absolute years for these things to be resolved, they're you know, challenging it, and but that that was those were the decisions that you can, you couldn't put a tax on one kind of sugar without putting a tax on another kind of sugar. Yes, but that was only for imported goods, or yeah, oh, yeah, not for goods produced. Oh yeah, okay, thank you, thank you for that correction. But in any case, it it indicates the the way these uh, arbitrators are, are decided. Just one question. It seems that, from what you just said, big corporations um, always win. Uh, well, they don't always win. They don't always win. But um, actually, I have somewhere a list of all the cases that have been decided. There, are about, there aren't that many, maybe 35, 40 cases that have gotten as far as that. And they, they don't always win, but these are a few of the cases that um, that have 
where corporations have won. But there is, there is some hope in the future. Another famous case was the metal clad case, um, which is a California corporation that bought a landfill site in Mexico near Guadalcazar. They wanted a, to build a hazardous waste site there, a hazardous waste landfill. The Mexican national government was all for it, because this is economic development. The local government refused to issue a permit for the landfill on environmental grounds. The arbitrators said that Mexico was expropriating metal clad's property by not allowing it to build a hazardous waste dump. It ordered Mexico to pay $17 million to metal clad. And I, get, I think this was never paid, that they, I, I believe they eventually um, overturned the ruling. But this was a, uh, a very notable case because here the local people did not want a toxic. Now, I have been looking to find out whether there ever was one built. Do you, do you know whether there were ever the toxic waste thing was ever built. Maybe, maybe the, uh, this settled the case, the ruling to provide. I, I've checked on the internet and I usually can find out does it exist today. I don't know for sure. But that was a very uh, significant case because all three governments, US, Canada, and Mexico, were very concerned about the threat to sovereignty by this kind of a ruling from the Center for settlement of disputes. Very recently there was a case where a U.S. company called Bilcon wanted to open a stone quarry in Nova Scotia. Here, the local people wanted it. It was a what we call a depressed area and they wanted some some kind of work. But the Canadian government stopped it on environmental grounds and Bill Khan sued Canada and won. I don't know how much, but this, this happened maybe last year or the year. Do you know the case? No, I have a question. Okay. Do the NAFTA decisions and the World Trade Organization decisions create precedents for those treaties? Do they create precedents? Um, mostly in international law, uh, presidents do not have to be followed. Mostly the uh, arbitrators are trying to f figure out how, how to meet the terms of the treaty without, I mean, of course they're interested in what has happened before, but they're not required to follow the presidents because, you know, every case is a little bit different. Uh, and and this, is, this is what happened actually. There's, there really is some progress in this area because um, the pressures from people concerned about health and environmental issues have led to a gradual change in the decisions of international arbitrators. Uh, Philip Morris sued Australia on the basis of a bilateral treaty. I think it was between some Southeast Asian country in Australia. Uh, because Australia had a law saying cigarettes had to be packaged in plain packaging. Because it, 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 Australia has had a major anti-smoking campaign which has actually been very successful. So we do smoking a lot in Australia. But they, had, they said, you can, you can only sell cigarettes with plain packaging, probably with some horrible warnings on it, too. <laughs> and uh, Philip Morris said, no, 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 this is a violation of their trademark. This is a violation of free trade to require them to do that. So the, the case went to the, um, the actually, the International uh, uh, Court of Arbitration. Permanent Court of Arbitration, the ones created in 1899, that case went there. So when you have a treaty, 
it will say inside the treaty. It says disputes are to be settled by the permanent court of arbitration. Disputes are to be settled this way or that way. So the arbitrators dismissed the case of Philip Morris. It said, Philip Morris, sorry. Australia has the right to require plain packaging on cigarettes. It's not a violation of free trade. And now, the more recently drafted trade treaties, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which failed, but inside that Trans-Pacific Partnership was a recognition of the right of nations to enact legitimate public welfare measures that would not be regarded as restraints on trade or investment. So because of the protest of, of people in the world on these grounds, the, the, the people who want treaties to be adopted have had to bend a little bit. And there is still, of course, the issue of what is a legitimate public welfare measure, which the arbitrators are going to have to decide, and what's a restraint on trade. But there's a little bit more recognition that environmental and health issues are uh, not restraints on trade, and they have to figure out, or, or even labor protection. So they, they recognize, and there's one reason the Trans-Pacific Partnership did not succeed was because of popular protest on the grounds of, of these treaties, which seem to take away the sovereignty of countries and even local governments to protect their population. So there's a little more, and uh, Norway also, in negotiating new treaties, new trade treaties, has put in some pretty strong provisions for the protection of human welfare. And so that's, it's, it's moving a little bit. Um, now, the other thing, have, have I been talking too long? Is it is okay? I have a little bit more. A, a little bit more, okay. Um, international law has a lot of provisions that relate to the prevention and mitigation of war. In 1928, the Kellogg-Briand Pact outlawed war, but it was not enforced. It is still, however, a treaty that's enforced. Enforced, but not enforced. It's, it hasn't been abolished. And th that treaty did influence the Nuremberg Tribunal, and it influenced the UN Charter. The UN Charter says, all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. Also, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. In other words, the threat of force is illegal in international law. And then there's a question of what is what constitutes the threat of force? And certainly, if, if it's a direct threat expressed, that's certainly a threat of force. There's no question about it. that's what they're doing. But some would say that um, sending warships into, <laughs> into territorial waters of another country is a threat of force, or <clears throat> having war games on the border with live ammunition is, is a threat of force. That's what the UN Charter says. Now there are exceptions permitted. Um, exceptions are permitted if their force is authorized by the Security Council and five permanent members have veto power there. Individual and collective self-defense is permitted in response to an immediate attack. Only in response to an immediate attack. And only until the Security Council can deal with the situation. So force can be used not, not in, there's no such thing as preemptive self-defense. If a, an attack is happening, 
country may counter with force. That has to, force has to stop when the attack stops or when the Security Council takes it over. The Charter, however, does not outlaw military alliances, which would seem to conflict with the whole basis of the UN being collective security. That, that many people who were supporting the UN said, yeah, <clears throat> the problem was the war was, created, was spurred on by all these military alliances. And we have to get rid of the military alliances, we have to collect. That was permitted. So one of these alliances, NATO, has actually loomed as a giant competitor to the UN. NATO even has grant programs and environmental committees. I, that's one reason I got very interested in NATO, because my, my major field of research is uh, the influence of foundations on public policy. And I, I see NATO is actually operating as a foundation in many ways. It's operating as a, an international government, not just a military alliance. It has a lot of civilian parts to it. Um, the, other th the other thing that um, is a little troublesome and has caused a lot of trouble is that the Charter of the UN does not outlaw civil wars or revolutions, only wars among nations. And uh, in fact, the Soviet Union would not have joined the UN if it had outlawed revolutions, internal revolutions, because the Soviet Union uh, at that time believed this was the way socialism was going to come about, through revolutions, civil wars. But the problem is that these civil wars, internal wars, are open to manipulation by outside nations. Some of them have even been created by outside nations. And uh, once, once you overthrow a government, the new government is not going to appeal to the, uh, the international courts because now they're, you know, they're under your control now. They're your puppet government, you know. So you got them there. So this, this is a, a real problem and one of the reasons why uh, so much of the, so many, many, many of the wars and attacks have been, uh, have not been dealt with by international, they can't be, but there, there has, have been some that have. Uh, the International Court of Justice actually made an amazing ruling against the United States in the case of the war in Nicaragua, the Contra War. The International Criminal Court, which has been created rather recently, has not been, has not defined aggression as a war crime yet, but they're, they're, they may be doing that soon. And all of its convictions and most of its investigations have been against Africans. And this has lowered the reputation of that court very much, because people in the third world say, oh yeah, only, the, only Africans are guilty of war crimes, according to that court. Um, but now, there's, there's been a change. Now the court has begun some moves to bring cases against major Western powers. And the, pro, the chief prosecutor of the court is a Nar Nigerian woman lawyer who, has, who is held in great esteem in the field of international law. Um, the International Court of Justice takes cases only among nations. And it does a lot of, a lot of its cases deal with boundary disputes. And they settle them and that's fine. But punishing warmongers has been much more difficult. Because a lot of cases are dismissed on jurisdictional or other technical grounds. <coughs> For example, enforcing the UN Charter ban on war. In 1999, the court rejected Yugoslavia's lawsuit against the NATO attack of 1999. It was dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. The US could not be sued because it didn't consent to jurisdiction. 
After the Nicaragua decision, the U.S. said, we no longer respect the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Forget it. We're not going there. You can't get us. Um, the, um, some of the NATO countries had agreed to compulsory jurisdiction, such as France and Canada, but that didn't help. The court said that when the proceedings were begun, the applicant, Serbia and Montenegro, was not a member of the United Nations, and therefore could not be a party to a case in the court. Because after that bombing, Yugoslavia was destroyed, and Yugoslavia couldn't bring the case. Yugoslavia was a party. And afterwards, it was Serbia and Montenegro left, and that uh, they, they weren't a party to the court. No, so they couldn't sue. So that was the thing. Um, the court has also um, been asked to, uh, for an advisory opinion on whether the use of threat or use or even possession of nuclear weapons violates international law. Because according to the humanitarian law, any, any weapon that does not distinguish between civilians and combatants is a violation of humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions, among others. Um, even, even weapons used against enemy troops in a war are not supposed to be disproportionate to the military objectives. Even if, if you're, so nuking civilians is certainly a violation, but even nuking competence can be considered a violation in many cases because they're disproportionate to achieving military objectives. But uh, the court's opinion on nuclear weapons was mixed. They said they can't dis conclude definitively whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons would be lawful or unlawful in an extreme circumstance of self-defense in which the very survival of the state would be at stake. And another recent case was um, the case of the Marshall Islands. You may have heard of this. They brought a case in 2014 claiming that some countries had violated the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968. Those parties to the treaty were supposed to undertake nuclear disarmament. The Marshall Islands, which had been subject to intensive nuclear bomb testing claimed that these countries had done nothing or they were even beefing up their nuclear arsenals. So they sued um, several nations. China, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, France, India, Israel, Pakistan, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, and the United States in the International Court of Justice. Only India, Pakistan, and the United Kingdom recognize the court's jurisdiction. None of the others had agreed to accept jurisdiction for that case only, because you can do that too. You can say, I don't recognize compulsory jurisdiction, but I will ask me each time and I'll tell you whether we'll take the case. Um, India and Pakistan were not parties to the treaty, uh, neither were, of course, was uh, North Korea or Israel. Um, but the court considered them liable under customary international law. They issued a decision in 2016. The case was dismissed on the grounds that there was not a legal dispute between the parties such as a formal charge to them by the Marshall Islands and a subsequent failure to pursue negotiations. So here's another technicality. They said there wasn't a legal dispute. The Marshall Islands just said these countries aren't following that, but they hadn't gone to the country and tried to get satisfaction. You know, there wasn't a legal dispute. That was their decision. 
So this is why it's so difficult. Um, but the publicity received by the case uh, and the new treaty, 2017, there's a new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. 2017, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And all of that, that was helped, I, I, I should think, by the Marshall Island case. All of this publicity now may help the issue, perhaps. Um, but I'm, not, I'm gonna stop now because it, it's gone on too long. I timed it, but it seems to have taken more time. Um, I, I would say that, let me just say one thing that I, I'll go into more detail later uh, in the course, is that the, uh, the, all the bureaucracies, all the committees, all the commissions that are involved in all of this globalized government, I think takes away a lot of the energy from local party politics, local electoral politics. Because it's much more glamorous to be on committees and commissions and uh, Amnesty International and human rights things, travel all over the world and issue reports, and uh, rather than being in a local thing. So, that, so there's a real gap between the elite involved in all of this and ordinary people who have less and less connection with politics at all. Yeah. Sorry. All right, before we have questions, uh, join me in thanking Joan for her presentation. <laughs> if you're able to stay, please join us for some discussion, and we'll start with yep. this gentleman right here. You may have just addressed this right in your latest statement, but I've had the feeling as you were describing the treaties and the various applications of international law, that more or less the players are the developed nations, the wealthier nations, the ones that have very organized governments. And I just said, is there any application to the underside? The, 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 the poorer nations, you mentioned Africa once, but that's about the only one. I haven't heard about the outback of oh. China, various things like this. Does international law only, it's only as people want to abide by it. And that seems to be the, the organized nations. Is there any application to the under nations? I, I would, there definitely is. It, it really is, has been very, very important to all the nations in the world uh, because it's been very helpful in things like human rights and very, very helpful in avoiding total exploitation by other countries. You know, the, the international law is definitely all over the world. The only, the only issue is that in most cases, the people involved in every country are, are members of the elite, and they they're they're good hearted. They're good hearted. Uh, many of them are fine. You know, they want to prevent horrible things from happening. They they may want to keep capitalism going, but make it humane. So uh, it's definitely um, definitely important, very important to the. Like, and I mentioned the Inter American Commission on Human Rights. And you can, go, uh, you can go on the website and see the cases they've dealt with. And there are a lot of cases involving tor police, uh, torture, in all sorts of Latin American countries. Well, I'm encouraged by your answer. And I have, I have, to, be, I have to be diplomatic, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to name any names of countries. But um, yes, that there are... Uh, there's a lot of recognition. In fact, in, at the UN, when it was being formed, the whole human rights movement was very, very str strongly supported by the Latin American countries. 